said. Okay. Introductory language for virtual public meeting chairs as of February 3rd, 2021. Pursuant to recently adopted amendments to the Illinois Open Meetings Act included in Public Act 101-0640, public bodies may in certain circumstances hold entirely virtual public meetings without a quorum physically present in any one location. On March 17, 2020, Village President Lawrence R. Levine issued a declaration of emergency pursuant to the authority granted by the Village Code, the Illinois Municipal Code and the Illinois Emergency Management Agency Act to address the health threat posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. On June 15, 2020, President Levine executed a written determination that given the ongoing emergency associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, in-person meetings of the Board of Trustees are not practical or prudent. On January 8, 2021, Governor Pritzker issued his most recent disaster proclamation and executive order 2021-01 that declared in-person attendance at public meetings of more than 10 people at the regular public meeting location to be infeasible in accordance the Open Meetings Act as amended by Public Act 101-0640. In accordance with the governor's disaster proclamation, Village President Levine's declaration of emergency and President Levine's determination regarding meetings of the Board of Trustees, Village President Levine has also determined that in-person meetings of the Community Relations Forum are not practical or prudent at this time and until further notice. Accordingly, this meeting of the Community Relations Forum is being conducted virtually with members participating through the Zoom webinar platform. Assistant Village Manager Sharon Tanner is in the conference room as required by the Open Meetings Act. I feel like I should get applauded every time I finish reading this. <laughs> by now I should memorize it. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> um, I would like to call the meeting to order. May I please have a real, roll call? Hey, Chairperson Dipti Clark. Here. Member Margot Flanagan. I see Margo. Margo, you're muted. I'm here. Here. Okay. Thanks. Reverend Gary. Here. Uh, member Anise Moses. Here. Member Amy Mysell. Here. No. Member Gary Rubin. Here. Member Hillary Scott. Here. Member Maureen Delvasori. Member Bob Young. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Um, before we begin, I would like to have a consideration of our March 3rd meeting minutes. Do we have a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Second. May I have a roll call vote? Uh, Chairperson Clark. Yes. Lanigan. Yes. Member Reverend Dwayne Gary. Yes. Member Moses. Yes. Member Mysell. Yes. Member Rubin. Yes. Member Scott. Yes. And Member Young. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Do we have to do the public comments, Sharon? Yes, since this is a public meeting. Um, so if you would like to, um, if you'd like to make your, your comments regarding that, I'm just verifying if there are any received in advance of the meeting. Oh, okay, okay. So while Sharon's uh, verifying if any public comments were submitted prior to the meeting, I would also ask if any members of the public uh, would like to comment on something that is not on the agenda. And if you would like to make a comment about something that's on the agenda, please hold it until later. If a member of the public would like to make a comment now on something that is not on the agenda, please press the raise hand button or uh, star nine if you're joining by phone. The village's public comment rules limit comments to three minutes. Okay, uh, we did get one public comment in advance of the meeting. It was a question. Uh, it came from uh, Kalpana Writer. 
uh, who wrote, hi, my name is Kalpana. My husband and I moved to Glencoe in 2019. This is my first time attending. Can you tell me what kinds of topics you address during these meetings? Thanks. And our staff did respond with a link to the, um, the meeting information as well as the forums presentation that was made in February. And it looks like Kalpana may be joining us this evening. So hello and welcome. Um, hi, Kalpana, and welcome. And I see, oh, saw a hand and then it went down. Maybe that was a wave. Um, I don't see any hands raised otherwise. And hopefully that has uh, answered your questions, Kalpana, if you were able to uh, see some of the information on the website. Otherwise, the best way to tell is just attend our meetings and in a couple of meetings, you would, you would kind of know what, what, what our um, agenda is and our initiatives are going forward. Okay. Great. Um, then without any further ado, I would like to get our meeting started today with a very special guest who, um, again, from on behalf of the forum, I'd like to really thank for accepting our invitation and coming on to um, our forum meeting. I will let Hillary Scott actually introduce Celia. Um, not to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> okay, so you, you all have uh, can see the newest face on the screen, Celia Buckman. Um, she is a student at Georgetown University and a graduate of Nutra High School. Um, like all of us, a resident of Glencoe and a lover of our community. Um, as you likely read or hopefully read in the pre-read, uh, Celia wanted to develop a better understanding of how we came to be where we are in Glencoe as it relates to race. And so uh, she'll share some of her findings with us and um, we'll be able to ask questions. Celia, take it away. Hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen for a brief presentation that I put together. Um, it's great to be joining you all. Um, as Hilary said, um, I have done a bit of research about Glencoe's racial past, um, just to give you a little more information about that. Um, I kind of started looking like just reading a lot more and looking at census data, census data around like 2017. Um, and then I worked with a really great archival center in Evanston called Shorefront Legacy Center. Um, which if you're at all interested in this historical approach, I would highly recommend um, they do research about particularly black communities all around um, the North Shore with a focus on Evanston, but have some great resources about other suburbs as well. Um, so I interned there and then I wrote a blog post about um, that covered most of my findings about Glencoe. And it might be a little bit repetitive if you read this, um, to now sit through this presentation, but hopefully it'll like jog your memory or if you didn't have the chance to um, read through that, I hope that it will be informative. Um, I'd also just like to note that like, I don't consider myself an expert on Glencoe of any kind. Um, and I don't necessarily know if I'd be able to answer like any given historical question about the suburb, but I did um, think that there's, Hillary asked me to cover like a couple of different assumptions that I run into when I talk on this subject. Um, so I'm going to cover two of them and I'm, it's going to be pretty brief. Um, I'm hoping to leave a lot of time at the end for any like questions or discussion you all may have. Um, so anyway, getting into it. So the first assumption is that people think that Glencoe never had any black residents of any kind, which is simply false. Um, I was particularly struck by this newspaper clipping from 1884, so right around Glencoe's founding, or maybe even before it, um, which is a, was about a picnic um, that like, mem like members of different communities from all over the North Shore, um, Black people came together and had this picnic in Kalk Park, and there was a transcript of a song they were singing in 1884 that reads, um, we'll rest in this beautiful land just along Michigan's shore, sing the song of Moses and the lamb and dwell in Glencoe evermore. So it's this idea that I think is, um, you know, very familiar to anybody who has lived in Glencoe, that Glencoe is like this idyllic place. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, this idyllic place. And given that it was founded as 
a, an escape from the city for uh, wealthy Chicagoans. And then um, obviously very beautiful, very idyllic, um, this paradise. And this was not like exclusive to white people like ever um, in our community's history. So it goes back very far. And then there's many other examples of this throughout the years. So for example, the Wilsons, our family that lived at Glencoe for over a hundred years, um, were very involved in the founding of the St. Paul AME Church and funded it themselves originally built the, um, or bought the land that it was originally built on. Um, I found this clipping of an event um, inviting people to a reading of Langston Hughes in Glencoe <laughs> in 1944, which I had never heard of. Um, and was particularly struck by that, reading uh, Poems of Negro Life in 1944. Um, the, uh, there were civic rights leaders who lived in Glencoe, A.L. Foster, the executive director of the Urban League, who also sued um, the Glencoe Public Beach over its segregation policy and won back in the 40s. Um, and concerned Black parents of Nutria, I was also struck by this example of um, parent Nutria parents coming together to advocate for civic rights, um, like hiring more black teachers at Nutria and recognizing Martin Luther King Day. Um, and because there was um, the majority of, or a critical mass of black parents lived in Glencoe, it's where they met um, and their leaders were generally um, from Glencoe. And it was like a stronghold of black, like black civil engagement um, at Nutria was based out of Glencoe, which I think today I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh yes, of course, like that's the hot spot of civic engagement at Nutria, um, like not necessarily an obvious thing to me, but it seemed like during its founding, it was. So the flip side of that is that Glencoe wasn't always necessarily welcoming, and I'll come back to the census as it's like a bit out of order as it stands now. Um, this definitely does not like the presence of black people in Glencoe does not mean that the town was welcoming at all. I also, I think there's like a tricky balance to walk because Glencoe is very different from the other North Shore suburbs in that it didn't outright outlaw um, people of color or Jews or Italians from living in it. Um, it instead had private forces that um, in this case bought and sold uh, black people's houses and black residents um, land because in the name of property values. So this was in the 1920s, um, the area where like South School is now, as well as like the green areas by Green Bay Road, um, were mostly inhabited by Glencoe's lower income residents who were mostly recent immigrants um, or black. And there was a self-styled syndicate that bought up all these properties um, in some cases, the families did not want to sell their homes. They were forced to settle in court. Um, and their homes were bought up for these green spaces, which like, I always found it odd that the fields behind South School, like there's a road in the middle, which is like not convenient for small children. Um, but it's because it was strategically designed to displace as many people as possible. And so understanding that, um, you know, the spaces that we go through are not designed by accident, even when they're inconvenient for everyday use, but rather that I, there was a, an extremely racist and violent history behind them that made them the way they are. And so going back to the census data, um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. Um, so when I originally started doing research, the first thing I looked at was the census data, census data and you'll see here that the percent of the black population in Glencoe halves over this decade. And in this kind of demographic research, people will tell you that this like, this is never an accident. This is like something happened that displaced a lot of people. And I figure that this is the event that caused that. Like this was, this was the start of this decline. Um, and we can see that it was clearly at least in the minds of the syndicate a bit. Um, was at least somewhat effective because you see this massive decline in the population. So moving on, um, from then on, you see a decline um, in the percent in in the census in the census data of about one percent every decade leading up until now, or the 
2017 or 2015 data was about 0.7% of Glencoe's population is black. Um, and this was a letter to the editor from Melanie Marion, a Glencoe, uh, a black woman who grew up in Glencoe, um, lamenting the extremely, the astronomical property values of Glencoe, saying that she and her family would have loved to have been able to raise their own children in Glencoe, but were unable to due to the high property values. Um, and also mentions later in this piece, um, the amount of like single family homes that were more modest, um, being bought up for mansions, being combining different lots so that fewer families can live there, um, and building these, these mega mansions that only the super rich can afford. So at the same time that you have this like declining population, you have this like very weird reaction <laughs> um, in the papers around like the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, um, where as you can see, like they're, they're really grasping onto something and they're saying things like, they're profiling black women who grew up in Glencoe and saying things like lifestyles others seek was hers. Glencoe was so idyllic. Like they never experienced racism here. Um, they didn't realize racism was real until they left and they went somewhere else and had this experience. Um, you have this piece, Assumptions Don't Hold, Glencoe is 6% Black. The idea that Glencoe is this like huge outlier um, when really like it's on such a decline that the like it ended up being exactly like what the assumption was about Glencoe. Like that did become a reality um, like 20 years down the line. Um, but at the same time, like I think it's so important that we acknowledge that there's such a rich Black history here that we have kind of erased. Um, and it's so different from a suburb like Kenilworth or Winneka, where Black people were all together barred living there, or there wasn't a single resident until a single Black resident until like the 60s or 40s or 50s. Um, and I don't know, I think that people generally assume that you know, every suburb of the North Shore was just redlined the same way. Um, whereas really, like, not only does that overlook the rich cultural experience that people did have here, and often like intercultural experiences, because there were only so many uh, places that had some form of racial integration on the North Shore, but also overlooks the role of like private going coast citizens in their everyday lives, who decided to band together to buy up these properties, like no one told them to do that. Um, and the way that Glencoe residents like waged this form of violence against each other and that it wasn't just like some powers that be some like, you know, like, like, I don't know, some mayor like out there somewhere. It was like community members being like, we got to do something about black people living in our town, um, which is really, I think, scary to me as a resident, um, but also and very disheartening. But also, I think cuts against this narrative that it was like only um, lawmakers who were doing things like that. So yeah, that's kind of. I said it would be brief, <laughs> um, but I wanted to open up to questions and discussion um, for, yeah, I'd just like to get your reactions, and I'm sure you all have thoughts about this as well. Yeah, hello. I, uh, my name is Bob Young. I, I want to thank you for your interest in your work. I'm curious, when you were at Nutra High School, what were you taught about civil rights on the North Shore, about uh, Blacks on the North Shore? What did you learn in high school? Um, honestly, never, never touched upon. Um, we certainly learned about like Brown v. Board of Ed. I would say the discussion kind of stopped there. I wouldn't, I was in like an American studies class my junior year, which I think was viewed as being kind of like the crunchier version of like, you know, an A push or uh, like a normal American history class. Um, and even then it was, I don't think we really got past the eighties and we also didn't do any kind of like local history at all. I think, you know, it was like fun when there was a mention of the city of Chicago, but generally very uh, siloed, I think, from the actual experience that we were having in the classroom, which was 40 white kids mm -hmm. in one classroom <laughs> and two white teachers. So no discussion, no teaching about restricted covenants or clergymen on the North Shore who were very actively involved in the civil rights movement? No. Well, 
That's very interesting. Thank you. No problem. Ms. Buckman, Reverend Gary, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, have you found any information about red line? I heard you mention the word, but have you found any information in your studies about redlining in Glencoe? Yeah, I have heard from other community groups um, that they've found evidence of it. In my analysis, I didn't run into, into, into any sources that mentioned it. I definitely don't like preclude that from being true, um, but I didn't run into anything that like specifically mentioned it. All right, and my second question is now after you did your research, what's next for you? With all this information that you have attained, what does it say to you? What actions do you think um, we as a community can look into? What's your thoughts? Yeah, this is interesting because I also have grappled with this for a while now. Um, honestly, when I first was conducting this research, I found it very enlightening. I found it very interesting on a personal level, um, but I really wasn't sure what to do with it. So I wrote this piece um, and honestly, there had been like no response or like interest until uh, summer 2020 for I think obvious reasons. Um, but I would really love, I think like the ideal use of it is in an educational context, um, teaching, are in our public schools, what our town's history is and why it is the way that people experience it and why it is, you know, the way that we live in it day to day. Um, I also think like public commemoration is really important. I was really inspired by Brian, Brian Stevenson's work um, and had that in mind while researching because he talks a lot about proximity, how you like can't do anything unless you are very proximate to an issue. Um, and I think in a community that is as privileged as Lenko, it's often hard to take a step back and think about problems in our own community. Um, and, you know, whether that means like putting up markers on Green Bay Road saying, you know, <laughs> Black people were forced out of this land. Um, I think that's really important. And I think that's like something that people should, you know, be forced to acknowledge on a day to day basis or like what would be even more, and I don't have the legal chops or it would require a lot more research to do this, but like who were those people that we forced out and how can they be compensated? Because a house and land in Lenko is worth a lot more than it was then. And the way that intergenerational wealth is accrued in this country is a lot through real estate. And so the fact that those families were forced out so many years ago, they like, that's, that's decades of wealth that they lost um, because of this, this racist syndicate. And so like that form of reparations, I think is really important. So all, all, all this rant to say, I, I don't really have any like concrete, like here's the exact thing that should be done. Uh, but I do think there's like a way to scale it up. Celia, I was touched when I read in your um, piece um, of research, nearly all white suburbs are not natural. They are the product of deliberate racial discrimination. And I, and I know that you have done lots of research to know that, but could you tell us more about what you see in Glencoe today to, make, to have that statement written, especially when majority of our residents probably feel different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that there's this pervading belief among people that like, oh, Black people just never came here. Like they just, they were not interested or what have you, which is just like a false given the fact that like we, we have a, a rich history of Black residents in Glencoe. Um, but B, like there's the scholar James Lowen, who's a sociologist and history professor who researches sundown towns, which Glencoe is, Glencoe is not a sundown town, but like Forrest and Kenilworth were. Um, and his thing is that like black people tried to go everywhere in the United States. And if they're not there now, there's a reason. Um, and it is deliberate discrimination, whether at the private, but often the government level as well and a policymaking level. Um, so obviously I think that was reflected in what we talked about and how that manifested in Glencoe. Um, 
but yeah I think that there's like it's one thing to be like oh all my neighbors are white and then it's another thing to be like I wonder why <laughs> like what happened here like there was there was some act of violence for that to for it to be like that um and I feel like understanding taking taking the time to understand that where you live physically is the result of these histories is uh a humbling but be like it makes you reflect on what you do in the present like who's what space are you taking up how how do these how do these effects exist in a racialized um space that we constantly inhabit not because of our own choice but because that's how our how our country systemically is um and then i think that we might make policy and individual decisions a little bit differently knowing that it's not a neutral space. So I have a follow-up to that. How, how do your other colleagues, your other students, whether they were at Nutria or the other youngsters um, feel about this? Um, are they with you? Um, have you guys thought about maybe taking this to our Glencoe schools? Um, you know, engaging the uh, board and, um, you know, with your studies? Yeah, I mean, I, so I conducted this research when I was a freshman to sophomore year of college. So I wouldn't say it like really overlapped with my new share experience at all. Um, I would say though, just like among my peer group and my age group, I would say there's generally um, like, a more ingrained understanding that this is something that we should pay attention to. Um, and like, I think even just given the heightened awareness from over last summer, um, I think that there's like a new demand for education about this issue. I think people are coming to realize that, you know, we don't live in like our, our town is not neutral, no town is. Um, and understanding the actual dynamics of how we got here, I think is important. Um, I think there's like, there's a general, a more general awareness around that. Hi, I'm Anise. Um, I don't know that you, you can't see me <laughs> because I'm driving, but um, thank you. Your presentation was really interesting. Um, I have, well, I, I have a graduate of Nutrier and I have two boys at Nutrier and I have a 12 year old who will possibly end up at Nutrier or maybe somewhere else, I don't know. Um, how, you know, and I don't know if this is too hard of a question because of the place you are in your life. And if it is, you know, just say so. But, you know, a lot of people go back to where they were raised to raise their families if they decide to have the family. And if you decided down the line you wanted to raise your family, do you feel like the way Glencoe is right now, that would be a place you would want to raise a family? And if so, why? And if not, what what would you want to have be different to be raising a family in Glencoe? And I know that's kind of a traditional question. Not everyone wants to be a parent, but I'm, I'm kind of coming at it from that perspective and from some of the work that we're doing, trying to make our community a place where people want to be, where all people want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotta say, uh, being in my last semester of college now, I'm really, I'm really thinking about the next six months and not really thinking about the next 10 years or so, uh, or 20 or 30 years. So I gotta say, has not really crossed my mind. Um, I, I mean, though, like, I know, I don't know. It's, it's like, I think we have to move beyond the idea that just like living in an all white place is like natural. Um, I don't think it is. And like having grown up in Glencoe and, you know, known very few uh, other black kids when I was growing up, like honestly, if any, I'm kind of, I, I was like a bit uh, like, I was a bit just like shell shocked that uh, that's the way that I grew up. Um, and I would have to reflect really hard on that in order to uh, make that decision for anyone else to grow up in that environment. I mean, I definitely, I have a very privileged childhood. Um, I'll also add that like, I, I'm Jewish and I thought that Jews were a majority until like in the world until I was like 14. Like I really didn't know that Jewish people were a minority. Um, 
for like a, a, an extended period of time, which I think says a lot about how that, uh, how anybody's upbringing affects like their view of the world. Um, and everybody thinks that their upbringing was normal unless they had a, a reason to believe otherwise. But I think that that's like a generally true statement. Um, and as much as like, it was great being <laughs> that, that my particular minority was the majority and that I went to 90 bar mitzvahs in seventh grade. Um, like, I, I don't know if, if that's the, the right environment for somebody to like gain consciousness about, about the world. Um, yeah, I don't know. The other thing, just like, while while I'm on the topic of um, Judaism, is I was also interested in learning about like why there were so many Jews in Glencoe, just like out of curiosity. Like I went to New Trier, I was very confused, like as to why all of a sudden I like felt like I was sticking out. Um, and there's a lot of research about how uh, most Jews in Chicago lived on the South side and then they couldn't get into the elite country clubs there because they were discriminated like out of religious discrimination and so they went to the northern suburbs and they opened up places like North Shore Country Club and Northmore um etc you, you know the scene um and then began living there full time when they were like this is a nice place and then during the great migration so many black migrants uh moved into those places that Jews had once inhabited and so they were like for, there are now like black churches on the south side that like used to be synagogues and we think of Glencoe as having no connection to the south side as a, aside from like charity drives um, and we think of them as so disconnected from the great migration and these other national events that took place when really like that's that's also such a major part of how our communities are interconnected um and Glencoe, as we know it, like I wouldn't have had that experience. I don't know if my parents would have moved to Glencoe had there not been such a vibrant Jewish population. And so I digress, but um, it's all interconnected. And I think it really does form somebody's worldview and the way that they grew up. Thank you. It was a very thoughtful answer. I appreciate it. I know I was putting you kind of like I was time traveling you like way in, in <laughs> advance. So, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Can I ask a question to Amy? And, um, I'm curious if you or any of the other members of the forum know if there are still some families, if you will, the Wilsons, I don't know, and others who um, were directly affected by kind of being pushed out. And, um, and so it's a two part that. And then the second part is, um, Gary, maybe you know, does the board at large have a pretty good awareness of kind of this deeper history, you know, so is this kind of a news flash for, as it is for some of us? Um, I'm curious if this would possibly be something they're kind of aware of and whether like the historical society, I don't know, tells any of this part of the story uh, because if it's truly, you know, you'd think that that would be an important part of talking about the past 150 years or whatever, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as the families that were displaced, um, the ones that were displaced by the syndicate were back in like the 20s. So I don't have names and I'm not familiar with like the familial, familial histories um, of those individual families. I haven't seen things like legal records that name plaintiffs, et cetera. Like I'm, I'm just not as familiar. Um, the Wilsons, I'm, I'm sure the Reverend would be able to speak to this more um, than I would, but um, were li live live slash present tense live in Glencoe still um and are highlighted in many documents newspapers uh pamphlets like oral histories of Glencoe as like a very prominent um and also just like a like a family that like united other um black families as kind of like a like a center point of the community in Glencoe um so there, there are many, many documents that uh, detail their family history. They've done, you know, some um, amazing community building work over the years, um, but they, they were not displaced uh, by the syndicate. Yeah, but I'm sure, uh, I, yeah, I haven't been able to find any like legal records of those settlements and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I'd love to see if they're out there. I honestly don't, don't even know where I would look, but 
sure they're they're out and about somewhere. And yeah, I'd love to hear uh, from this group if you all are like familiar with these kinds of histories. I know the historical society, like I had spoken to them once or twice and they were like not too familiar with them. I was like, please get in touch with Shorefront. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the Glencoe Historical Society now is doing a lot of research on civil rights in Glencoe and elsewhere in the North Shore. So if you've not spoken with them for a while, I would certainly talk with Karen Edelson, who is the president. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you talked with them? Uh, back when I was doing this research in summer 2018. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, they are uh, diving deep into the history and I also know, have you been in touch with the Winneka Historical Society? I have not, no. Okay. They've done an excellent job in terms of civil rights on the North Shore. And a lot of their work is available online. So that's another resource that you might want to take a, a look at. Um, and as far as being a Jew uh, here, my wife's family moved to Winneka prior to World War I. Jews. That was almost unheard of at that time. I would have, I, I would love to have a seance with them <laughs> to be able to learn more about their experiences as a Jew in Winnetka prior to World War I. It boggles my mind. Uh, it boggles my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Different, different world. <laughs> Well, uh, not so different. The, I mean, you know, uh, more similarities than differences, I assure you. Amy, in terms of your question of the board, um, honestly don't know what other members of the board do or do not know because it has not been an active topic mm -hmm. at our meetings in the last couple of years outside of our discussions of the forum, such as the one that we had when we presented uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago at the, or a month ago at the um, uh, meeting of the whole, meeting of the members of the whole. So uh, no, I don't, I'm not familiar, um, but as long as I've got, I'm unmuted, I just wanna say Celia, thank you very much for your presentation and your article, very, very well researched, very well written and very thought provoking because it does appear that there was a combination of concerted private action, but there was clearly also governmental action uh, in, involved in um, uh, trying to ha uh, have fewer Blacks in Glencoe, and it worked very successfully. Um, and I imagine you are familiar, I'm trying to remember if you cited it in your article or not, Color of Law. Mm -hmm. book by another Chicago resident and which is excellent which does deal with a lot of those kinds of issues in terms of what government actions in particular were taken over many 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 years uh, until very recent times uh, and one could argue still uh, in terms of perpetuating uh, systemic racism and, and the effect the linger the very very long-term effects including the the loss of generational wealth building that you referenced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the color of law is a great, great read, very informative. Yeah, yeah. and so, specifically on like the federal, especially on the federal level, it really goes in very deep, yeah. But anyway, again, I thank you very much for this presentation. It's, appreciate your coming and taking the time to do this for us. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you all for having me. I think Hillary has her hand up. Yes, thank you. A couple um, sort of disparate points. Um, number one, I want to go back to Reverend Gary because I felt like um, Celia kind of teed him up to respond about the Wilsons and I wanted to sort of hear the answer on that if you don't mind if I'm not putting you on the spot Reverend Gary. Um, but before I mute myself again. Um, also just wanting to point out, which I think you were fairly clear about Celia, the idea of kind of redlining in spirit and in letter. Um, so, you know, there are all sorts of forces at work um, beyond, you know, even after, um, you know, federal housing discrimination was, was, 
was outlawed. Um, and in fact, I think those are so, some of the most pernicious and, and long lasting of uh, the types of redlining that we still see in communities clearly today. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure, I think it's important um, as uh, member Rubin said, to get to the bottom of where, you know, sort of where the, the letter left off and the spirit picked up. I'd like to know if there were any specific policies in our history that we can point to, but, um, you know, the effect is, is the same. And, and I think regardless of um, our wonderful history of civil rights work, um, that that's not, there, it's not inconsistent. It's not, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say this that way. Um, it's not impossible to have good civil rights work happening in a place where racist people are living and acting at the same time. And so um, I don't want, you know, I, I'm grateful for the work that has been done in Glencoe up until this point, but there's still lots more to do. And I think the more we focus on like, look at all this great work we did and not so much on the things that, um, we didn't do or that we did wrong, we're just not going to get anywhere. Um, so that, those were my points. That, and thank you, Celia, you're amazing. Um, of course, thank you. Reverend Gary. <laughs> so no, you did not put me on the spot. I was going to answer the, the questions. Um, we have five and six generations of the Wilsons that attend the worship service at St. Paul. Um, there is one family member that is married into the Wilson's family through cousins by the last name of Rankin that lives in Glencoe. Uh, so that's the only connection of families of that Wilson family that still resides in the Glencoe area. Do you have a relationship with them, Reverend Gary, with the Rankins? Yes, yes. Uh, Ms. Rankin is my admin at St. Paul. Oh, even better. And no other, I mean, I guess I didn't mean only Wilson's. So are there some, any other families that kind of go back to this period of the 20s and 30s and whatever when things got, you know, when they got bought out and... So I can only go as far as back as the Wilson's family, Nancy King family, uh, the Rankins. Um, that's as far as I know of uh -huh. historical people in Glencoe that was connected to St. Paul. And, and, and Celia, you had mentioned like when Reverend Gary asked what's next, you know, some of the ideas that you had was, you know, let's let's find the families, let's give them what's their fair share, you know, let's work in looking at the policies. Uh, have you ever reached out to our village, to our um, village officials, or I tried to meet with them? Um, you know, since we're talking like government official work, uh, you know, uh, and and presented this information and see what, what their uh, feedback might be? I haven't. I never felt like I had enough data um, to specify like that kind of a policy. Um, it's, it's pretty, like it's pretty old. It's pretty buried. Um, like I said, I didn't, I couldn't get my hands on any like legal records with plaintiffs and the settlements and the amount of these settlements. Um, and so I never felt like I had enough to like really make a case that could be translated into policy, but I do think that it's like an avenue, um, worth pursuing on that level. If people have the, the resources and the know-how to get those. And I also, I think I, I believe that they were forced to settle. Um, and obviously, you know, having, being targeted for that kind of buyout in and of itself is, such a violation and such a such an injustice, um, but legally, it's does it? I, I I'm not sure what the gray area was on, like whether uh, you know to the extent to which they were forced to settle if they were undercut the the property value at the market rate at that time. Um, you know, obviously they had every right to stay there, um, given that their families were living there and that's where they chose to live. Um, 
but I never felt like I had enough to like make that kind of a a case for that concrete of an action for how funds should be redistributed. Well, we would like to have you on more to see um, as we're moving forward, you know, get some fresh ideas, you know, you're young, you have a different perspective and, you know, we're all working towards making this change in Glencoe. Uh, there's always going to be those that don't believe it or don't, don't think it is, uh, it is how you have portrayed in your research. I mean, have you had any pushback? Have you had any residents, friends, family members, neighbors, you know, um, say that? Not really, but I feel like, I feel like there, uh, that I've been asked to do these kinds of presentations at like relatively like friendly audiences to the research. Um, so I can't say that there's been like a lot of that. I will say <laughs> that um, when I was like at Nutrier, I like waded into the seminar day controversy and got like smacked down by Breitbart, like very publicly. Um, and that that was like not a fun experience. Like I do it again, but it wasn't uh, like that was uh, like not it. Um, and that that had obviously as, I'm sure you all know, um, like some contention within the community, like at large. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, I think that the groups that I've presented my research to are relatively receptive. And are you working with any of them um, to, you know, on any programs to move things forward? Um, I've, so I worked with HEROES, which I believe is, I might get the acronym wrong, but, uh, Healing Everyday Racism yes, in Schools. <laughs> yes, uh, with the save. Um, and I know they're working on some programming for this summer around Juneteenth, and that they're also particularly interested in tracing the history of redlining, um, potentially like doing a walk through Glencoe along where this red line was, um, and I've also just, they, but they work with, uh, you know, they have, they're involved in across many different suburbs of the North Shore. And so I've also really urged them to, uh, you know, seek out their own local histories as well, because I think it's important to identify like the, like each one of these suburbs was just like so different, but all kind of arrived at the same place demographically by like the 2010s. And I think it's like very fascinating the way that it like played out so on such a deep level so differently like almost like anyway um but yeah so they've they've been um just like in contact just like floating ideas around and stuff like that um yeah i'd say that's like probably the main one that i've been in contact with uh just i don't know i meant to ask this earlier um any other groups of minority that were in glencoe that you uncovered that might have similarly been kind of pushed you know we're on the train line you know we have other groups that you know could very well have uh you know like what happened in highwood and so forth where people working on the train ended up settling there and stuff like did we mm -hmm. I, mean, of, <laughs> I mean of course i mean this is all to say like native americans predated any of any of this and were completely wiped out um or for or forcibly displaced uh, from the land where we, we now live. Um, in that, that syndicate incident, the, it, there were also Italian immigrants, um, possibly also Jewish immigrants, recent, Im like recent Southeastern European immigrants, um, also lived in that area. They were affected. Um, other than that, I mean, I think it's also, it's also distinctive to research black history because um, the way that our country categorizes race is so binary that it can be really hard to identify like when people are thought of as like Asian or Hispanic or any other category that is not just blatantly black and white. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so like that was interesting, especially looking through census data, the way that people self-reported their um, their race or identity or in certain cases, a census data taker would like go house to house during that time. I have no way to verify if this is how this particular census was taken, um, but just like look at someone and be like, this is this is what this person is. Um, yeah. And so it, it gets harder to identify different racial and minority and ethnic groups um, as you like go back in history, which is interesting in and of itself, but a whole different conversation. Um, and most of the policies that, I, or most of the like time frames that I looked at when there was this kind of racial violence, which is like so blatantly anti-Black, um, that it was easy to identify like that this was specifically the goal was to displace or harm or, um, you know, discriminate against Black residents. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, I, um, I really, I, I really think this was really, really a very helpful presentation because for me personally, I had very little idea of what you showed us today. <laughs> I mean, or actually none. Uh, let's just start with that. Um, I do want to say when we did bring up um, the question of redlining, Reverend Gary and I, um, we did get some pushback because there was not enough research done or there was no proof. And, uh, you know, so it's interesting when you had mentioned some redlining. And of course, redlining depends on how you um, interpret it as well. So it could very well be redlining for what was done in Glencoe, even if it was not in the traditional sense of what happened in like, you know, Winnetka, for example. So, mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, we would love to see if you have more research on that. If you ever do any research, if you ever find out more, we would really, really like to hear more on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to pass along any of the primary sources that I highlighted in my presentation or that I highlighted in my um, short front blog post. I generally like scanned full newspaper articles and that kind of thing when I was at Shorefront. So I'm happy to pass those along. Um, you know Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, please continue when you're done. Oh, I just had a question. I'm also happy to pass along um, Dino Robinson, who is the executive director of Shorefront Legacy Center, his contact information. Um, he's, he's great. He's extremely <clears throat> knowledgeable about um, Evanston's history in particular, but, and I'm not really sure what the status is on the archives themselves during um, the pandemic, but he's a very, very nice person. So I'll pass along his contact info. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question. You used the phrase, uh, you distinguished Glencoe from certain other immediately surrounding communities mm -hmm. as not being a sundown community, which, by which I take it you mean you, you better not be within the bounds of the community at sundown or, you know, like down in the south uh, where things would happen. Um, uh, and I'm just curious, what was it that you, was it simply because there was still a black presence, even if it was diminishing in Glencoe or, or why is it that we, in your view, weren't in that category? Well, I do wanna like, uh, qualify that by saying I'm certainly not saying that there was never like an act of racial violence or like hate crimes that like just you know occurred uh, without any like planned like impetus or something like that but rather there were certain towns where as a policy people of color um, in some cases Jews in some cases Italian immigrants in some cases other immigrants or other non-white individuals were simply not allowed past a certain time um, or they were subject to essentially extra legal state sanctioned violence so like mobs or uh you know police brutality was just like automatic like automatic uh automatic sanction on that it was just automatically like legitimate use of force against any person of color or any other um individual from a discriminated group was just not allowed during that time. So presumably, um, given that there were black families who lived in Glencoe for decades, um, presumably that was not at least done as a policy, like that kind of racial violence was not done as a policy. Um, 
Kenilworth was considered a sundown town. So James Lowen, the scholar who I mentioned before, has a uh, or like a database of sundown towns that existed all over the country, several in Illinois, but his always like his prime example in interviews is always Kenilworth. Um, also like Lake Forest, I, I believe it was Lake Forest, uh, specifically against uh, black residents, but also Jews, not like not allowed past dark. Um, so that's very, that's still like a very stark difference between that and Glencoe where there were black re residents living there since the 1800s. I mean, like, that's very different to me. Or, like, Kenilworth didn't have a Black resident there until the 1960s. Like, that is such a long, that, like, that is 80, like, that's 80 years of difference. That's, like, almost a century that Glencoe had Black residents living there. And so, like, that's, a, that's just, like, qualitatively a very different quality of life for somebody living in, with it so close to each other. Um, and it's just these very disparate, histories that essentially happened over these towns that are like you know no more than five like five square miles but like so much happened within those contained borders thank you I want to be mindful of the fact that we're so far over with the time that Celia promised for us and she's very gracious and I think it's easy at least for me to forget that you're still like a 21 year old kid um, who probably has a lot of competing, competing demands for your time so I want to give you the ability to to sign off um, if if you need to uh, because I I think you've been so generous with your time we're really grateful yeah I, just, I want to I want to give an opportunity to are if there are any public comments because, because we have some participants and if there are any because I'd seen a hand go off or up earlier but um, if if there are any public comments on this topic if anybody would like to make a comment they can they can do so now um, before we adjourn our meeting there is a hand I see one so bear with me one second I will unmute Okay. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just, I, I know that Celia um, mentioned the Color of Law book and the North Shore Congregation Israel did an excellent um, event with the author on that book um, just a few months ago. So I just, I, I was going to mention it, but then I was glad that um, Celia mentioned the book as well. That was it. I, it. I don't think the book specifically mentions the North Shore or Glencoe. I think it was just, for me, it was just so overwhelming. I stopped reading it after about a hundred pages, <laughs> but I just wanted to um, thank you for mentioning the book. My God, of course. And thank you for mentioning that community event. I'm glad that, I'm glad that there was an opportunity to engage with the author like that. And thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad that this topic is, you know, gaining a little more momentum and awareness. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to keep in touch. Great. That would be great if we could keep in touch, Celia. Like I said, you're young and we have not heard about all of this before you came on. So um, this has been very helpful. Thank you. Of course. Everyone have a have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so again. much. Thank you. I see um, your hand is still raised, Ms. Ryder. Did you have an additional comment or was that just an uh, inadvertent click of the button? Oh, I thought I lowered it. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. No worries. Just wanted to be sure that we gave you the opportunity. Thank you. And are there uh, any other? Oh, I see another handout. Great, Raphael Guzman, your line is open. Hi, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Raphael Guzman, and I thought that was a phenomenal presentation. Um, my wife and I moved to Glencoe approximately five years ago, and uh, one of the things that, when I was researching uh, Glencoe, that came to, uh, that came quite surprisingly, and it was uh, refreshing was the fact of the of the uh, the Baptist church in town and the fact that it was one of the oldest I believe in the state uh, but it immediately raised the question as uh, 
uh, how is that possible? Because with all due respect to my fellow Glencoe residents, we're not necessarily known for the large minority population. Um, so when doing that research, and I didn't want to take any more time, any more of her time, but I, I, I wonder the African American residents that were here at that time, where were they employed? The North Shore is not necessarily known as a as a um, industrial area. Unknown caller. And, and and so and so for me, they, they bring up this 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 fact of we had the residents, then they were forced out, and then why didn't they come back? And I am not attempting to cause controversy or cause a argument, but it's very much a historical um, facts that people in certain communities are pushed out when that real estate becomes viable for other members of the community that have the ability to have that wealth and power. Um, this research is readily available. I think that her paper and her presentation did a phenomenal summary of it, but when we moved here, we spoke to some Glencore residents who are third, fourth, fifth generation. And one of, one of my neighbors explained to me that there were fires in the 60s and 70s. And after these fires came down, there were some laws passed, uh, ordinances that prevented those that were displaced from rebuilding. Um, I think it's important to know our history because once you understand your history, you're better able to move forward. Um, I just hope that when we review this information and look at our historical background, we're not necessarily only doing it for the exercise, but more so to have a better understanding of what could possibly be moving forward. But I commend you all uh, for um, for the meeting. It was a, it was a wonderful presentation, and I, this is my third one I've, I've watched, and I, I really enjoy uh, listening to your guys' um, topics and how you move forward. Thank you, Rafael. Good to hear your voice. Do we have any other business that we want to talk about? Or any four members would like to raise? You know, the fact that she said that when she was at New Trier High School, that nothing was taught, if I understood her correctly, about uh, civil rights on uh, the North Shore, uh, I find not surprising, but shocking. Um, and it just points to what I believe uh, the gentleman just made a comment about the importance of history and the importance of the forum uh, serving as a forum for teaching residents about the history of their community. I mean, to, to my friends, none of this is new. Housing discrimination, I mean, just going back to World War I, uh, returning GIs benefited from the Federal uh, Housing Administration. Federal Housing Administration was involved in redlining from day one, uh, discriminating. There was redlining in cooperation with banks and in cooperation with insurance companies. None of that is news, but apparently it is news to many people. And the fact that a school with the reputation of New Trier, assuming what she said is still true. Uh, again, I find it not surprising, but shocking. How could you go through Nutria High School and not learn about what was going on and is going on in the North Shore? How, how, how is that possible? I can tell it's you that it's possible. not still true. Um, the question is to what extent and to what extent is it like extracurricular, meaning um, teachers, I, I mean, I'm not going to use names because frankly, I'm not sure if it's um, as woven into the curriculum as as it is meant to be. But um, there are certainly teachers at both Central School in Glencoe and at New Trier that spend a lot of time teaching this history. Um, and so you know, I think we really, to your point, Bob, we really need to take a look at that. Like, why is there this idea that 
you know, if they're not teaching it, it means they're teaching it underground. I mean, there's just a whole, there's a lot of questions there that I think require investigation. I can also say um, my daughter had a very different experience in nature than Celia did as far as learning about civil rights um, in our country, our community, and, um, you know, the, our town, um, and as did I as a nature graduate in the 1980s. So um, it may be that it's just such a large school and there are so many options um, and so many teachers that it just may be a, a factor of where you land and, and what, um, it's, it's definitely not required material, um, like learning the US constitution is, um, but it is, it is an option for students who are looking for it or stumble into it by fortitude. But I do believe that this is not a history lesson because this is life. This is how we live every day. It's not, racism is not done. It's not over. So when we actually consider it as a history lesson, part of curriculum, I feel like that's really, that puts an end to something that was in the past and it's not in the past, it's in the present, it's happening. So it needs more discussions. It needs more uh, classroom open discussions with teachers and students alike, and maybe their assemblies. I don't know how they do it in schools in America. I did not go to school in America, but we used to have something called assemblies where we used to gather and have discussions on topics. And I feel like this is a, this is a current affairs topic. This is current, this is not history. and the more kids or, or students talk about this, the more they're going to learn about the past. Well, you know, William Faulkner said that history isn't dead. It isn't even past. So, you know, when we talk about history, the automatic reaction is that it's in the past and that it has no relevance, but it has every relevance to what's going on now. And if indeed, uh, the history of civil rights on the North Shore is not part of the curriculum at New Trier Township. And I don't know the answer to that. That, that, is, that is very, very shocking. Very, very shocking. I hope that's not the case. I mean, I would assume any educated person would know about these things. But that might be a huge assumption on my part, and it very likely is. Well, look at what, look, oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Go, go ahead. ahead, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, but look what happened with Diversity Day at New Trier. I mean, it was like a tragedy upon tragedy disaster. And, you know, I couldn't believe that that was happening. I couldn't believe that people were accusing that of, of being a liberal agenda, no. you know, to talk about equality, to talk about racism, to talk about these things that plague our society and hurt people. And I, I, I mean, my kids were in school when that was happening. I, I couldn't believe it. And, you know, it kind of died down, so to speak, but it died down and what has happened exactly? Like, it feels like it's sort of been dropped. I mean, I have to say I'm not, granted I have kids in the school system, but I get overwhelmed. Um, so I haven't followed every single thing that's happened since then, but you know, I got several whiffs of what was happening and it was really disturbing. And, and that's now. But has, hasn't that day been dropped? They haven't done it for a couple of years, right? Right, exactly. Because parents protest, protested it and the Breitbart stuff that um, Cecilia, Cecilia was talking about, you know, they went after um, students that said they felt there was merit in diversity day and it was important and kids that were kids and parents that were supporting it um they got targeted they got harassed they got put it their names got put in the newspaper where they lived like all kinds of aggressions against them because they wanted diversity day so yeah it hasn't happened and what does that mean well Again, I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but did the administration of New, New Trier fold on this issue? Well, it's not happening anymore. So, I mean. It sounds like they folded them. Well, the diversity day isn't happening anymore, is it? Right, no, it is not. 
So that sounds like a fold to me. I think there's some complexity to it. Um, and I, but I'm like you, Bob, I'm not, I haven't done a lot of research on this in, in recent years, but um, I know there's been a lot of re emergence of this conversation with the April 6th um, school board election. So that might be, you know, without us going on a wild goose chase, like live and in person via Zoom, um, that might be a good place to sort of dig around if you're, <laughs> if you're looking for the current status of things. I know that's what I'm going to do once we hang out. So and I do know that Heroes has been doing a lot of research on, on these kind of topics, especially as it relates to Nutrier. You know, I know curriculum was a question on their agenda once. Um, so they've probably made a lot of progress. So that might be a good group to tap into, Bob, uh, if, you know, for more information on specifics to Nutrier, because I think they have a, a lot more information. They do have a group of parents who are real advocates and um, uh, working towards change. So that may be someone, and I can get you in touch with a couple of people I know. Um, if you have more questions on that, I think they would be the right people also to have more information. Thank you. And uh, with that, shall we, shall we adjourn our meeting? I think it was a really good meeting today. Um, so if uh, there's no other business, um, I'd like to confirm our next meeting is in April, on April 7th, Seven. thank you, Sharon, at 5 p.m. And our town hall series will be on April 21st at 5 p.m. And on the 7th, we can share more detail um, on that particular town hall series. Um, and for just for the good of the order, I did confirm there were no other public comments that were submitted during the meeting by email. Okay, thank you, Sharon. So then may I please have a motion to adjourn? I so move. Second. May I have a roll call, please? Sharon, you're on mute. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, Chairperson Clark. Yes. Member Flanagan. Yes. Member Reverend Gary. Yes. Member Moses. Yes. Member Mizell. Yes. Member Rubin. Yes. Member Scott. Yes. Member Young. Yes. Okay, then we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Bye -bye. Hillary. Yeah.